Okay, if we could get everybody to please come in and take your seat. It is great to hear the fellowship. I want to say once again, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this year's lectureship. We're honored uh, by your presence here and uh, just very thankful for this opportunity to get together and study God's Word and uh, hear these great men preach, proclaim to us the Word of God. I've asked Ken Dottie to lead us again in another song, and after that song, uh, I will introduce the, our next speaker, Ken. Let's turn to the last song in the book, 990. You are the song that I sing. We'll sing it through twice. <clears throat> Shall we sing? You are the words in the music. If I could have the, the good fortune of selecting the speakers for Thursday night, it would be the two speakers that we have tonight. Dan Winkler and Eric Owens are uh, two men that uh, I just love so much and have the highest admiration and regard for. Uh, Eric is one that, uh, again, I've known uh, for a long time. He preached in the Avondale, uh, uh, Georgia congregation for 25 years. He also served as one of the elders there uh, for a portion of that time, uh, but recently made a major life change uh, and moved from uh, the Atlanta, Georgia area to Round Rock, Texas, to a large church that's there. And uh, Eric is uh, getting his, uh, his bearings in the, in the new work uh, there at the West Side Congregation. Eric is someone that uh, is an outside-the-box thinker. I've always admired that about him, not only in the, the way that he approaches various topics uh, that I've heard him preach through the years, but during COVID, he was one along with Jonathan Jenkins that said, we've got to do something in order to help the church during these uh, kind of dark times in our nation. And so they created a uh, series of sermons, online sermons uh, that were available for people to uh, get into God's word and hear messages preached from uh, <clears throat> various men throughout the brotherhood and 
Uh, I had the, the blessing of being asked to do that. Michael Hyde and Wayne Berger and Donnie Bates and others have uh, also uh, preached for the digital Bible study that uh, has been done. And it has been so popular that it is still ongoing, although Eric told me that it's kind of on a pause right now. Um, but they're uh, contemplating what's going to happen moving forward. But that gave people like us an opportunity to hear preachers that we might not otherwise be able to hear. Uh, preachers that some of which I'd never even heard of before and thought, man, this brother is very good and what a great lesson. And, uh, but that was an out, outside the box uh, thought that uh, Eric had. He is someone that uh, is, preaches so clearly, very sound in the faith, and I just love and appreciate him so much. And so without uh, taking any more of his time, uh, Eric, come preach the word. Thank you. Malachi chapter 3 will be our focus tonight. And as you turn there, I'd like for you to think about relationships. Relationships. You've probably heard it said, God is a God of relationship, and that's certainly true. He is presented in many ways in Scripture, in a relationship with us. He is our Father, Master, Lord, King, Friend, Husband. And as you think about relationship, think about God in the relationship. And think about man in the relationship with God and Give God a voice in that relationship. The book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Gives us insight into the state of God's people prior to the 400 years of silence. The style of the book is unique. Malachi raises a problem between God and the nation. Questions are asked, objections are stated, and then they're answered. Those problems, that some of which include problems with the priests, they make no distinction between the holy and the common. They don't honor God. They treat God disrespectfully. There are problems with the people. They question and dispute God's love. They do not honor God and despise his altar. They break the covenant of marriage. They are not prepared for judgment. They rob God in tithes and offerings. And despite all of that, the book still ends in hope and expectation that God will send his messenger, prepare himself a people for the coming Messiah. In our text, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 specifically, God explains why, despite the treatment he has received, despite Israel's behavior, they continue to exist, and why he has not destroyed them for their evil. He said through the prophet, For I, the Lord, do not change, or I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, O sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? They had been disobedient nearly from the beginning. In fact, you get some sense of how long God has endured from the phrase there in verse number 7. God says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. It got me to thinking about the relationship between God and mankind. It has been, and in many instances, continues to be what can only be described as an abusive relationship. The abused continually looks for better treatment from the abuser. The abused keeps doing right despite the treatment received. The abused keeps hoping it will stop. The abused keeps believing things will get better. The abused are taken for granted and mistreated, and the abuser thinks that the abuse will always take the abuse and will never go away. In this sad scene of abuse, it is our gracious, loving, and merciful God that is a victim of our abuse. 
two, two passages, at least two, demonstrate God's lamentation with the relationship. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse number 11, God asked Moses, the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them. Isaiah chapter 5 and the first seven verses paints a powerful picture of God's lamentation. The prophet says, let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard in a very fertile hill. He dug it, he cleared it of stones, he planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. But it yielded wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grace, why did it yield wild grapes? For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Malachi says God does not change. That's the explanation he gives for why Israel was not destroyed. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. But Israel and humanity continue only because of the unchanging perfection of God's character. But God has not been treated fairly. God loved his people and his love was not reciprocated. Scripture tells us God didn't just love Israel. John says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. John says, God didn't send his son into the world to destroy the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Paul added that that love, God's love, was extended while we were without strength in due time. While we were his enemies and ungodly sinners, Christ died for us. God was good to the Jews and he was good to humanity. And both groups returned his good with evil. Jew and Gentile mistreated every member of the Godhead. How was the father treated? Romans chapter 1 describes it in this way. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish heart were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. How was the son treated? Matthew 21, beginning in verse 33, records. Hear another parable, therefore. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it. And he built a tower and he leased it to tenants. He went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenant to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same thing to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. How was the Holy Spirit treated when he came? Acts chapter 7, verse 51 records, You stiff-necked people. Uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Jews and Gentiles, united together against God, Psalm chapter 2 describes, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. 
It wasn't just the Gentiles. The Jews did the same. 1 Samuel 8 and verse number 5, the Bible records now, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people. And all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The rebellion was despite warnings from God and pleas from God. Verse number 19 of that chapter, the Bible says, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. What did God do? He continued to plead. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 16, but his pleas were rejected. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient past. Where is the good way? And walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Rebellion reached the point of despising God. That's what Malachi records. Chapter 1 of his book in verse number 6 God says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. You can be in a relationship where you suspect mistreatment. Because you're unsure, you can keep going and you continue to love even if you're unsure. But it's another thing when they tell you, we despise you. It's recorded in chapter 1 and verse number 7. It's recorded again in verse number 12. The table of the Lord is despised. Jews and Gentiles were very dismissive of God. Psalm 10 records, For the wicked boast of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages in the hiding place. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in the thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them in to his net, the helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see it. Humanity did not return God's love, but God did not change. You see, his character is not affected by our treatment of him because God is not one of us. I am the Lord. I change not. How about today? To use Paul's language, we might ask it this way, are we better than they? If that was Israel and the Gentiles of old, we, God's people and the world today, would never behave that way toward God, would we? Or have we? Or are we? How have you treated God in the relationship, really? God said through Malachi, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, the reason for what follows is I'm the Lord and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. The question before us tonight, and I'm going to ask you to please work with me here as hard as your mind will allow you to consider this question what if he did? I need you to imagine an impossibility in order to appreciate our reality and to appreciate our opportunity. What if God did change? 
What if God took his things and went home? What if he stopped extending himself? What if God allowed our treatment of him to determine his treatment of us and the world? Taken for granted, rebuffed, rejected, rebelled against, he finally said, okay, that's enough. Since you don't want me, I'm going to take my things and go home. What would we have? What would we be? What would we do? What would that mean and look like? No doubt you've heard the expression, you don't know what you got until it's gone. We would then. May I suggest before we continue that some gifts have to be conceded. There are things God simply cannot take, even in our imagination. You see, God made the world, Genesis 1.1. And the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. If God took his things and went home, there would be no earth and there would be no us. You see, we all belong to him, the world and all who dwell in it. So for our purposes tonight, we have to concede that he leaves the world and he leaves us. And while that might sound good, it's not nearly as good as it sounds because of what God has given to the world and us. If God took his things and went home, while the earth would remain and while we would remain, the first thing we'll notice tonight is that God would take love out of the world because God is love. John says, Behold, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. He's not, he is love, and then he modeled love. John says later, in this, the love of God was manifested among us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. It's not simply that God is love, that he modeled love. The Bible says he taught us to love. By this, we know love. That he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Someone might say, well, we could learn to live without God. Sure, we could. We could do that. I would urge, see the first point, God made the world, God made us. Without God, there is no one to love and receive love, and there is no world on which to express that love. We couldn't get along without him ultimately, but listen, we couldn't learn to love without God because love wouldn't exist without God. We can concede existence, and we can concede ourselves, but we can't concede love. Begin, if you will, just try to imagine living in a world without love. But that's not all. You see, God would also take goodness out of the world. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 explains, As he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There is none good except one, and that's God. We would have a world without love and without goodness. Someone said, no big deal. We could get along. If you're thinking about existence without love and goodness, then friends, you're doing it right tonight. But if I don't have your mind participating just yet, would you pause long enough to participate? Try to imagine a world without love. Try to imagine a world without goodness. But God wouldn't simply take love and go home. He wouldn't simply take goodness. God would take peace out of the world. Romans 15, refers to God as, now the God of all peace be with you all. Chapter 16 and verse 20 of that book says, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Christ is referred to as our peace, Ephesians 2, 11 to 16. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things, verse 33 of chapter 16 says, I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, not if God took his things and went home. All we would have is tribulation. But then, number four, God would take comfort out of the world. 
The Apostle Paul refers to God in these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are also in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Listen, we can't practice that. We can't practice verse 4 because God took his comfort out of the world. And it was the comfort that we received from God in our affliction that we used to comfort someone else in their affliction. But since he didn't comfort us, we don't have any comfort to give. Not only are we uncomforted ourselves and we don't have any comfort to offer anyone. Number five, God would take grace out of the world, his grace. Paul says we are being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, Romans 3 and verse 24. And when Moses asked God who he was, recorded in Psalm in Exodus 33 and in the chapter 34, among the things that God says of himself is that he is gracious. But that has been taken out of the world. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of grace, Hebrews 10, 29. God has favored mankind, but not anymore. God takes his favor out of the world. And without God's grace, let me ask you this, why would we be gracious to anybody else? As you're thinking about God taking his things out of the world, and as you're seeing them disappear, consider what it would do to us and one another. Abraham went to a town on one occasion. He lied about Sarah being his wife. His explanation was he thought the fear of God was not in that place. Now, how do you suppose we would behave with no love of God, no goodness from God, no peace from God, no comfort from God, and no grace from God toward one another? Oh, I hope you're thinking and feeling and grappling with our losses, and hopefully you're still holding on to the things we have. Maybe in your mind right now you're thinking, but wait, there's still something we can hold on to, but let me continue because God would have to take light out of the world. This then is the message we've heard from him declaring to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's how John says it. And in the Gospel of John, the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. We usually stop there at about verse 3. But the verses continue and it says this. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighted every man that comes into the world. Later in the book, chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus would simply say, I am the light of the world. You know, the harder you think, the better it is. The greater your participation, the greater your benefit. If you're willing, think long, think hard about what God is taking from the world. If God took his things and went back home, we would have to live in darkness. God is light. Christ is the light of all men. The sources of light would be gone. The sun and moon and stars would all go. He left the earth. He didn't leave his light. These things belong to him, Jesus said as much in Matthew chapter 5. God's light would be gone. Christ's light would be gone. We couldn't be the light of the world or the salt of the earth. There'd be no light. Our eyes would be darkened. You see, God made those two. The hearing eye and the seeing ear, or the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord had made them both. Leaving us our eyes doesn't mean he leaves us any light. The darkness the Egyptians experienced caused them to sit still for three days. It was a darkness they could feel. The sky would be dark. The earth would be dark. Our continent, country, state, city it would all be dark. Our home would be dark. There's no generator coming. Our person would be dark keep counting what we have while we review we're not done see if God took his things and went home we would have no love no goodness no peace no comfort no grace no light all gone out of the world but since he's given more he'd have to take more God would have to take his long suffering and his mercy out of the world 
The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving transgressions, iniquity, and sins, by no means clearing the guilty. But thou, O Lord, art a God of full of, of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Not anymore. Psalm 86, 15. God will have to take his word out of the world. No, we couldn't know him. Because the only way to know him is through his revelation. Uh, he was gracious in giving it to us, but now his grace is gone, and so his revelation would be gone. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 following could no longer be lived out. No, he would still have something in his mind. We'd never know it. All scriptures breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's God's word you're holding. That's his mind revealed. But he took that and went home. Although you couldn't make it up because no prophecy came by the will of man. No person can sit down and write the mind of God. All those people who believe men wrote the Bible, well, they'd understand now. If God took his word, there would be no revelation from heaven, no knowledge of God's character, will, plans, or redemption. The famine of the word would be perpetual. There would be no Bible study because there would be no Bible to study. God would take his word out of the world. God would take the way to heaven out of the world. You see, if God took his things and went home, God would have to take Jesus out of the world. It was God who gave his son. But God would take his son and go home. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Paul said in Romans 8, 31, 32, that God didn't spare his own son, gave him up for us. Our Lord is referred to as the Lamb of God, that's what John said the next day, John 1, The next day, John saw Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Forgiveness of sins because of Christ's blood, Ephesians 1 and verse number 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But what if, what if when his son was praying in the garden, what if his son was praying to him, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What if he did? Try to imagine that the father looked at his son, looked at the history of creation to that very hour, simply said for lack of appreciation, for hatred and rebellion, for his enemies' rejection of the very son he sent to die for them. That instead of letting them murder him, he just said, son, come home. If God took Jesus out of the world, then God would take all hope out of the world. If we had a son, We've had everything. But without a son, we have nothing. Without Jesus, all hope is lost. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without Jesus coming, he cannot die, and if he doesn't die, he cannot be raised, and without the resurrection of Jesus, we have no hope. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
that you sorrow not even as others who have no hope. You see, without Jesus, all we could have is sorrow and no hope. You know, as the Hebrews writer said, and what shall I say more? He said, time would fail me to speak of. I offer you that same expression. What shall I say more? Time would fail me to speak of God would take away his church. God would take away worship. God would take away prayer. God would take away communion, giving, preaching, and teaching. God would take away truth, singing, forgiveness of sins. God would take away his relationship of marriage. There would be no objective morality. Every man would live in darkness and do what was right in his own eyes. There's probably a place that you can think of that has no love, no grace. No goodness, no mercy, no hope. God's gifts are so plenteous. God's goodness so extensive. I feel certain that I could stand here for days and miss things that God would have to take. Because despite how we have treated him, despite our hostility, our lack of appreciation, our disdain, our rejection, our dismissiveness, our rebellion and disobedience, our despising his name, we continue to enjoy God's great blessing. Why? Because I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know, after that book was written, God still sent John to prepare the way. And God still sent Christ. You see, God didn't take anything from us. Instead, he has freely given and continues to freely give his love, his peace, his joy, long-suffering goodness and comfort, mercy, grace, scripture, his son, the way, the truth, the life, his light. He continues to seek communion. He will share. In prayers, he will answer. Worship, he will accept. God's perfect character continues to shower blessings. God is a God of relationship. How have you treated God? God has given us a warning that he will come back. He will come back for those who are saved and he will take them home to heaven. The world will be burned up and everything in it. The righteous and wicked will be raised. The living will be changed. The sheep and the goats separated. Those not saved by Jesus will go away into everlasting punishment without God and all of his blessings. When? When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will pay the penalties of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. God hasn't taken them yet. Friends, he is coming back, 
and you need to be ready to go home with him. You know, if God took his things and went home, our greatest loss would be him. So let us live with appreciation, with reverence and joy, with thankfulness and knowledge, with love reciprocated, mercy and grace and patience, thanksgiving for all of the blessings that God has given and mostly for him and his desire to have a relationship with us. If you've wandered away from home, come home. If you need to become his child, do that. Thank God he has not taken his things and gone home. Thank you for your kind attention and may God bless you.